Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone out on this fine Wednesday night. We had a nice chilly spring morning this morning, and it warmed up nice and plenty of sunshine, so I hope you have enjoyed your day. We certainly want to keep uh, David, Peyton, and his family, and Curry and their family in, in your prayers as they are traveling. They're out in Memphis this week. With that being said, we're going to continue our video series that we have done in, when he was absent, and abounding in hope, abounding in hope. We're going to have, a, it's about a 30-minute video. We just got one class upstairs, and we're just going to have one bell. So we'll, instead of having a long intermission like we had last time, we're going to go ahead and get started with the announcements and invitation after that pretty quick. So it'll be less of a break. So I will turn that video over to Lee and get us started. To God be the glory. Hi, this is Bill Watkins, and while we're talking about living above the ordinary, life above and beyond the ordinary, I want to talk about something that probably isn't easy for most of us to talk about at all. If you're like me, in the last 12 months, we've lost friends. Some of you have lost very, very close family members. Some of you have lost people that are so close that you would rather take their place than to have them gone. They still hold half your heart, and you don't want to leave them. You're having a hard time dealing with that. And I thought that for just a moment, I'd like to talk for just a while about how Christians look at death and how they look at death because of one verse that God gave us in Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who are able to destroy the body, but are not able to destroy the soul but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In that one passage, Jesus tells us something so significant that we absolutely don't need to ignore it. We need to remember it and never forget it. He tells us four things, four things about dying that every person, and particularly every child of God, really needs to know. The first thing that he tells us is, that what happens to us physically is not the most important thing. Do not fear him who is able to kill the body, but is not able to kill the soul. You and I are not bodies that happen to have a soul. We are souls that for a brief and temporary time have been given physical bodies so that we can express spiritual things. What happens to our physical body is not the primary and most important thing. What happens in our physical body is important as it expresses spiritual things, that spiritual body that you and I have. We are a spirit that has a body. Now, why do I mention this to you? Because if I get that value reversed, then I get discouraged when death enters in into my circle of loved ones. I get discouraged when accident may injure and hinder my life from doing some of the things that I want to do. When age takes its toll and no longer are you able to run or to walk or to do many of the things that you used to do in the way that you used to do them. It's easy to get discouraged. But don't forget that you are a spirit and the spirit can't be hampered by age or time or disease or anything that this world can throw at it. If I get that understanding, then I realize how eternal I was really made for. Do not fear him who is able to kill the body, but when he kills the body, that's all he can do. He can't kill the soul. The soul continues on after the body has passed away. We're living in a house. The Bible says the earthly house of this tent. He says we know that if the earthly house of this tent be destroyed, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this we groan, longing to be clothed upon with our habitation, which is above. He says we, we groan not to be unclothed, but to be clothed. What is mortal might be swallowed up by life. You and I are a spirit. This, this body that you and I have, the Bible says it's sown in weakness, is raised in power. 
It's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown an inglorious body. It's raised a glorious body. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you're going to find out that this one was never meant to last forever. That it's like a seed planted in the ground, and what comes up beyond it is something more magnificent than you can imagine. And even though it's connected, it's going to be better. Going to be better. John Quincy Adams, when he was old and in very poor health, passed a friend of his on the street. And the friend said, how are you today? John Quincy Adams had a classic reply. He said, John Quincy Adams is very well, sir, very well. The house he's living in is dilapidated and old, and the owner has given word that he must vacate soon. But John Quincy Adams is very well. You and I live in a house, and all that we see of each other is our houses. Because of the actions, we do perceive what spirit is inside, but we can't see that. I look at you out of my windows, call my eyes. You look at me out of your windows, your eyes. What we see is just the part that was only the house that we lived in. So when we go to the cemetery and that body is laid to rest, it's just the body. The person is in a different place. That person still lives. They still live as surely as they were alive on the days that you hugged them, on the days that you told them that you loved them. They're still alive. The body is not the primary part of man. What happens to us physically is not the most important thing. There's a second thing that this passage tells us. Fear not him who is able to destroy the body, but is not able to destroy the soul. But rather fear him who who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The second thing that you need to know is that death is not the worst thing that can happen to someone. For most of us, Death is the worst thing that could happen. The Bible even calls death the last enemy. When it says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Yes, death is an enemy to us. We want to live. Everything in us cries out to live. Everything in us moves toward life. But that life that it moves toward is not just, even though we don't know it sometimes, it's not just physical life. My life is about life, eternal life. Life that goes on even beyond this. There are people all over the world who would give everything they had for a good conscience, for a good night's sleep. To sell out your soul for selfish profit is to lose your soul. To to sell out your friends for the sake of your own advancement is failure. To live and never develop a soul worthy of fellowship with God is ultimate destruction because it destroys the quality of life we call eternal. And when a person loses his soul, he's lost everything. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Selling your soul, far worse. Let me give you one more thing out of this passage. Do not fear those who are able to kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It tells me that the length of your life is not as important as the meaning of your life. Maybe another way to say that is that the quantity of your life is not as important as the quality of your life. We tend to think of lives that die young as tragic and lives that are older as understandable when death takes place. But life is more than that. It's not the length of it. It's not the quantity of it. I think about Methuselah. At 969 years of age, he was the oldest man listed in Scripture. And what did the Bible say about this man who lived 969 years? It says he had kids and died. That's all that it says. That's his legacy. Jesus lived 33 years and changed the world. It's not how long you live. It's what you do with the life you have that really matters. Life is about the quality of life. What are you living your life for? What are you willing to live for? Maybe more important, what are you willing to die for? Is there anything that you believe in strongly enough that you would be willing to die for it? Because 
until you come to a point that you're willing to die for something, I don't think that you ever get to a point where you literally live. It's not until we face death victoriously that we're able to live victoriously. And it's not until we actually live victoriously that we can die victoriously. What are you living for? Are you living for yourself? It's a pretty small thing to be living for. Are you living for your job? It's not going to love you back. It's not going to last either. Solomon tried just about everything in his life. He talked about riches and music and mourning and laughter, dancing men, dancing women. He talked about building and planting. And in the end, after having gathered jewels to the point that they flowed in the streets, after having gathered wealth like no other king had ever gathered before him, after having all the accomplishments that were magnificent in their own way, he said it's like grasping after wind. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. When he calls it vanity, he does not mean by that that it didn't have any meaning. He does not mean by that that it was useless. What he does mean that it's transient and you can't hold on to it and ultimately life doesn't find its meaning in that. Are you living for something? Are you living for something bigger than you? It's not about the quantity of your life. It's about the quality. What are you living for? And let me suggest one more thing. Do not fear those who are able to destroy the body, but are not able to destroy the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What I want you to know in that is that Jesus is telling us that life goes on beyond the grave. I think about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 15. Guess what? They're still there. They're still there. Right where they were back then. I think about the saints who've gone on before. God says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. I think about him talking about us coming to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I'm reminded that the night of his transfiguration, that Moses and Elijah came and talked to him about his demise that he would accomplish in Jerusalem, and they were still alive. You have not lost the people who've passed from this life. Death endures beyond the grave. It does. So what I would ask you to do is to honor the people who've passed from this life. What honor can you give to them? So many times I think that people believe that if they can just talk about how great that person was, that they will keep their memory alive and they will honor them. The greatest honor you can give to someone who's passed from this life is to live honorably as they did. And if they lived in faith, to live in the faith that they lived in, to honor the God that they believed in, to sacrifice for the people that God died for in Jesus Christ. That's the honor that we give. It's not just what we say about the dead at their funeral. It's how we live after they've gone. When their life, their faith, their joy, their hope, their truth lives on in us and for generations to come. What a difference it makes when I see that. Life goes on. Someone once said that living your life has no meaning. It's like dipping your finger in the water and then pulling it out again, and in the end you've made no difference at all. Can I tell you that that's bad science as well as bad theology? When you dip your finger in water, you create energy waves that go out from that in circles, all from that place. They go on indefinitely. And then when you lift up your finger, the water rushes back in and creates a, another wave that continues to go on indefinitely. And even though the wave actually is not water moving forward, it's water moving and the energy is moving forward, I would tell you that when your life has dipped into the stream of time, when the time comes to move that life out of this time where we live, the ripples of your life will go on and on and on. God said that he visited the iniquity of the fathers on the third and the fourth generation, Exodus chapter 20. But he blesses thousands who love him and keep his commandments. And the thousands under consideration are not the thousands who are living now, but the thousands of generations that will come afterwards. Your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will suffer 
if you lived your life in a wicked and immoral way. Not because God is punishing them with your sin, but because the effect of your life goes on for three and four generations. But if you lived your life honorably, if you lived your life loving God, loving your family, loving his church, if you lived your life honorably, long after you're gone, when people whose names have never yet been thought of are living a life where your name has long been forgotten, the good that you've done, the truth that you've taught will continue to influence their lives for good. Life goes on beyond the grave. This road is just a test. If I finish the race, I get to do something better in the future. Someone said, this life is like a play. If we play our parts well, we'll have a bigger role to play long in the next life. Jesus, in telling the story of the judgment, gave the story of the men with talents, and he said, you have been faithful in a few things. I will make you rule over many things. There's a time to continually grow and become because of what you've grown and become while you were here in this life. Whatever it is that you've begun, it makes a difference in the life to come. I had a young man come to me not too long ago who's suffering from a terrible genetic lung disease. Most people who live with that disease don't survive beyond their 20s. He was 18 years old. He said, I'm not going to go to college. And I said, why not? He said, because with my disease, the likelihood is that I will not live through college and I will just have that much expense to leave to whoever's behind me and I'll have all of this that I've prepared for and it will be of no value at all. And he and I talked about that. And I told him, listen, I don't think you're thinking about this right. Every single thing you do matters in the life to come. Every single thing you learn matters in the life to come. And I asked him what he loved and he told me, what he really enjoyed doing. I said, pursue it, pursue it. And then if you don't live beyond your college days, guess what? God will find a way to use that in heaven. But if you do live beyond your college days, you'll find a way to bless the world with the things that you've learned. Don't ever stop. If you thought that the world was going to come to an end tomorrow, plant a tree today. Bless the future because you don't know what the future holds. All I know is this, the ultimate future is that God will hold me close and life will be amazing. In that, I can be sure. Some of you woke up today and you're, you're hurting. Arthritis or heart pain or, or distress or sorrow or loneliness has just enveloped you. I want to tell you there is a place where God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, nor sighing, nor pain anymore. For the first things have passed away. That's what God is preparing for you. And that is what the future is really all about. A number of years ago, in fact now it's been a long time ago, when my oldest son was six years old, we were given an opportunity to do something we had never done before. At the end of a, of a long valley in North Alabama called Doran's Cove, there is a cave. The cave is remarkable, that cave. It's known as Russell Cave. Before Alexander began his conquest of the world, there were Indians who were living in that cave. It has a very large mouth, and they were living in the mouth of that cave. But the cave goes back far into the mountain. The Indians always lived just in the front part of that cave. More artifacts have been taken from that place that go back to those ancient days than any other uh, archaeological site in all of Alabama. The man who was the ranger for that national monument, Russell Cave is a national monument, invited my son and I to go with him because once a year, it was his duty to go into the cave and map out all of its chambers, to go and, and to look through all of those corridors and chambers and to see what it was like. And he said, it's time for me to do that, and I'd like to invite you and your son to come with me. 
So we readily agreed. We showed up on that day and he handed out helmets and gloves to us. And on the helmets, we had lights. I'd never worn those before. And we walked out of the world of color and light into the gray world of the mouth of that cave. And the further we walked into that cave, it turned from purple to black, and the lights would show shades of gray everywhere that we would go. It was interesting and a little bit dangerous. If we hadn't been with the ranger, we would have been in trouble. There were certain places, caverns in that cave, rooms in that cave, that were full of deadly methane gas, that if you went in there, you would die of asphyxiation. And so he kept us out of those rooms. But he took us everywhere else. And I can remember there were places where I would be crawling on my stomach and my back would be scraping on the top of the cave. I can remember thinking in those moments in that narrow little opening that if this mountain just shifted slightly, I would be one squished creature. The world would never find me again. But I went on and I kept following that ranger and we went through and we would enter sometimes into caverns that were so high that when you lifted up your eyes to look at the top, the light just barely would shine on the ceiling, which was long, long away. And it was in the middle of one of those chambers as we were about a mile deep into that cave that the ranger said, turn off your light. Jim, my son, and I turned off our lights along with the ranger. And suddenly something happened that had never happened to me before. I was in outer darkness, utter darkness. I kept thinking, like any other time in my life, that my eyes would eventually get used to the darkness and I would begin to see things. But the problem was that there, one mile deep in that cave, was the total absence of light. There was no light anywhere. And you're never going to be able to adjust to it because there's just no light to adjust to at all. That made me uncomfortable. But as it made me uncomfortable, it made me think about my son, Jim, six years old. And I know that he's standing somewhere close by. He's never been in blackness like that. And he didn't particularly like being in darkness anyway. And I thought, I hope he doesn't panic. I wonder what he's thinking. I hope he's going to be okay. And just as I'm thinking that, I felt his small hand reach up and grab my hand. And he stood there with his hand in mine, perfectly calm. And it didn't matter how dark that place was or whatever was going to come, as long as he could hold my hand, he was okay. Some of you know what that feels like and you've never been caving before. You've left a world of light and sound and color and entered into a world of grief and loss and difficulty. And at first, things turned a little bit gray. And then they turned completely black. And you had hoped that maybe it was all a dream, that you would wake up and all the loss would be done, that it was just your imagination. But it's not that way. You were hoping that somehow you could adjust to the darkness and that things would go back at least somewhat like they were before. And it's just not happening. That belief has been smothered by the black emptiness that envelops your heart like a shroud when you feel the loss of someone that you really truly love. In the reality of the darkness, there's something even more real. God is reaching down his hand and saying, take mine. There's a hand in the darkness for you to hold. Your heavenly father holds it out to you right now. He's nearer to you than you can imagine. And he's not waiting for you to travel to a cathedral or to a synagogue or to a church building. He's in your reach. In Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 24, this is what Paul said. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he has made of one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Now listen, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move 
and have our being. We are his offspring. In the darkness, he's there. The Lord is near to all that call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Psalm 145, verse 18. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor in any wise forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And if you look at the Greek, it's even more specific where he says in our language, more like, I will never, no, never, no, never leave you nor in any wise forsake you. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In times of difficulty, the psalmist said, but for me, it is good for me to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. God could not be closer to you physically than he is right now. He's in the air you breathe. He's in, every, in the DNA of every atom and molecule of your entire body. The invisible things of him are clearly seen, being perceived in the things that are made. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. But you need to understand that God is a spirit, and spirits are not brought close by physical proximity. That's the reason you sometimes feel alone in a crowd, and why physical relationships don't always bring about kindred spirits. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And that spirit of God, in the person of Jesus Christ, stands at the door of your heart and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. God is not the invention of a brilliant mind. We are the invention of a brilliant God who never has let us go. And that God has his hand out to you. That God is reaching out to you. That God is knocking at your door. So he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. God rewards people who reach out to his hand. Don't miss it. Reach out to the hand of God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. There's some verses in Psalm 91. I just want to read somewhat at random. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wing you will take refuge. His truth will be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, God said. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Don't miss the God who is reaching his hand out to you. The darkness will not last forever, but the hand that holds you will. Trust him. Thanks for watching.
Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone here tonight. We are so thankful for your presence. We, uh, as I mentioned before class, we certainly want to keep uh, the McClure's and the Paytons in their prayers as they are traveling to the lectureship to the Memphis School of Preaching. So I know that uh, Curry said that they were coming back tomorrow. I'm not sure about David, but they'll be back be back directly, I'm sure. So be sure to keep them in your prayers. Angela McCauley is still on hospice care, and she's staying with her Aunt Glenda in East Ridge right now. Please remember her. Ruth Crow uh, still having problems with her knee now. Uh, Joyce and Lord Wright need our prayers with health issues that they are having. James Moore is having a heart cast tomorrow. Friday, Friday, having a heart cast Friday, so please keep that in your prayers as well. We also want to remember uh, Ralph and Nancy as they travel down to his sister's funeral in Elberton, Georgia, so please keep them in your prayers. Also want to remember Nancy Wolf, who is under hospice care, and Tina Busby Floyd, who has been moved to life care facility in East Street. Please keep her in your prayers as well. I also have an addition. Uh, Jared Scarborough, this is Wanda McNair's son-in-law, has been diagnosed with cancer, and we want to remember Jared Scarborough, Scarborough in her prayers, and also his mother, Robin, uh, also has had a heart attack, so they're having a lot of, a lot of bad health needs in that family, so please keep that family in your prayers. Don't forget to keep our graduates in your prayers, if you haven't got your pictures, but Debbie yet, make sure you get those to her. Men's breakfast is this Saturday, April 1st. Looking forward to that good meal and good fellowship time. Uh, our youth led worship for the evening services this upcoming Sunday will be led by our youth in that 5 p.m. service. So please encourage them with that. Also, this Sunday will be card group one following evening worship. Middle group, our group one. Uh, we're going to just walk through it just like we did with group two last time. So we're going to have cards set up, thanks to Tara. And uh, just, we'll just go down after after services, have a seat, and hand the stack of cards out, have some directions in. So it'll, be a, it'll just be a piece of cake. Team singing for April is going to be on the 16th. It's going to be an Uzwar. The Pleasant Grove. Church of Christ has Lady Day scheduled for April 22nd. Also, don't forget the wedding shower for Chloe. That is Sunday, April 23rd, 2.30. Here's the church building, and they are registered at Amazon. Amazon. Also, don't forget to sign up for youth activities. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to host one of those for 2023. There are several things on the bulletin board. Hope that you will take time to look at those. I do have one here. I haven't announced in a while. It's uh, Lessons from Lives Well Lived. It is a lectureship hosted by the East Tennessee Church of Christ Single Group. So you can uh, take note of that. It's uh, registered online by April 14th if you are interested. And it will be held April 21st to the 23rd. Don't forget to to keep your prayer list in your prayers. This is a, a blank list. I hope the year has names on it. And we certainly want to remember those, even those that you've already turned in for cards, or maybe especially those you've turned in for cards. We're going to send cards out to all those folks on Sunday. Let's pray about that because if we're sending in cards and we're praying for them and we follow up with a visit, God's going to give them God is going to give them At the proper time, uh, Closing prayer will be led by Dalton Gilreed. We will turn our thumbs up to God. Open call is 297. 297. I want to be a worker for.
on faith that he had on Sunday, people that we need to, to be like. He talked about Abraham. He went to Genesis chapter 12, read that first verse to us. We know a lot about Abraham because he's spoken of a lot in the Old and the New Testament. And what I'd like for us to think about tonight is uh, some advice from Abraham on how to get to heaven. Advice from Abraham on how to get to heaven. I think we'll look at some parallels between Abraham seeking the earthly kingdom and how we see the heavenly kingdom. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. God told Abraham to go to a land that he would show him. If I read that directly, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now God tells us something very similar in the New Testament. He tells us to go to a land that he's prepared for us and that he has shown us the way. And for that we'll go to John chapter 14. Go to John chapter 14 and read the first six verses there. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. When God told Abram to go to the promised land, he said, go to a place that I'm going to show you. Now, Abram didn't really know the way, but he knew that God was going to tell him the way. So he, he had faith, and he planned on going to, to get to that man. Well, in the New Testament, God has said, Jesus said, I've got a, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I have a place for you and you need to plan on leaving this earthly place that we live now and being there with me later. Thomas said he don't know where, where he's going, but he really does. And Jesus corrected him real quick that you do know the way because I am the way the truth and the life. We know that we can go to the Father. We can go to that, that heavenly paradise by following that way. The next step, you know, the first step was God told Abraham what to do. Well, God told us what to do, so if we parallel that, we're going to do like Abraham did, and we're going to listen, and we're going to believe him, and we're going to act on that belief. Just a few verses down in Genesis 12, 4, we find that Abraham did believe what God said, and he believed it to the point that he obeyed him. Genesis 12, 4, so Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and he and Lot, uh, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Paris. So here he was, 75 years old. 
He just picked up and left. God told him to leave. He picked up and left. Well, we have to believe and obey just like Abraham did. Now, the Old Testament is something that's written for our learning. It's also a shadow of things to come. So I think if we parallel what Abraham did, what we have to do, I think we can find some wisdom there. But we have to believe God. If we read Mark 16, 16, the verse that all of us know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So if we want to make it into that heavenly place, we have to obey just like Abraham did. We have to believe it and we have to obey it. 1 John 2, 3 says, And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's obedience. We have to believe those commandments and we have to keep it. We have to obey it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 tells us that those that do not obey the gospel of our Lord are going to have vengeance taken on them by, by Christ when he returns. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8 And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there you have obedience again. You have to believe what the Bible says. You have to believe God when he tells us that he has a kingdom prepared for us. And then you have to obey it. Lastly, we read in uh, Joshua, and then a little bit of a twist in Hebrew, that Abraham's descendants were given the promised land. They were given the promised land. God said he was going to give it to them, and he did. You read Joshua 21, 43. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. So here on earth, there was that physical, earthly promised land that the children of Israel took hold of, they possessed it, and they dwelt in it. That was the promise that God made, and that's the promise that God's going to keep. If we look on to Hebrews 11, 16, we... We read just a little bit more about that. Because it wasn't just the physical promised land that, that Abraham was really interested in. Hebrews eleven sixteen says, But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared, prepared for them a city. So even Abraham and his descendants, even though they received that promised land on earth that they were promised, they were still looking for a better city, that heavenly city. And that's the same city that we have. The question for us tonight is, will we enter that promised land? Well, it's up to us. We have a decision to make. Are we going to obey that gospel? Are we going to believe it? Are we going to trust what God says and follow his commands that he has in the Bible? We know that we have to obey the gospel. We know that includes hearing the gospel. We've heard most of it tonight. That Jesus lived on the earth and he died, was buried in the ground, and was raised again on the third day. We need to, we need to do the same thing. We need to be recognized that, that Jesus is the Son of God, confess him, be buried with him in baptism, Rise to walk in human life. That's how we obey the gospel today. If there's anyone here tonight that has any need that they need to take care of, whether it's uh, prayer or to obey the gospel, we encourage you to take care of that need now as we stand and as we sing.
Hopefully we can all say it's been good to be here tonight. We're very, again, thankful for everyone being here. Make sure that you uh, do keep your eyes on the prayer list, not just the ones that are mentioned tonight, but the others that are mentioned in the bulletin. Don't forget the men's breakfast here on Saturday, uh, Bible study at 10 o'clock on Sunday, and worship at 11 and 5. Make sure you're here for all of those. If we have nothing else, we'll be here. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are thankful again for this opportunity tonight to be here, to gather together, and to hear another portion of your word. We're thankful for Brother Bill and and, uh, and Jesse and David and so many who uh, stand before us and and share and open your word to us, Father. We pray that, as always, we'll take these things as we leave here now tonight and not only apply them to our own lives, but share them with others so that they can see what it's like to, to live a Christian life and to have that hope of heaven that we talked about. Father, we're so thankful for our good health and ask for continued blessings on those who are less fortunate. Father, for those who have lost loved ones, we pray that you'll comfort them as only you can. Be with the Paytons and McClure's as they travel back and others as well who may be traveling, that they'll journey home safely and be back with us once again very soon. We love you, Father. We're so thankful for all that you do for us, all that you give us, and bless us with, especially Jesus, and we pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.